Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Pao Her, for asking me uh, to join this panel and for asking the Sexual Harassment Working Group to uh, co-sponsor and co-host this, this event. And thank you to the panelists who I'm so grateful to, to be here with. And I'm looking forward to the day that we can automatically believe that we're gonna do this in person together. And so I can give everybody a really big hug before and after the panel. Um, because the fact is, is that these types of conversations, um, they are very important, but they are also very difficult. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, there might be some people who are sitting and listening in who have their own experiences, who have either reported them um, public, you know, talked about them publicly, who have told maybe some family and friends or who have not told anybody else. And when you hear these kinds of things, even when you're talking about it in the way that we are here today, um, it can be really difficult. And for some of us, I know for myself personally, that that difficulty, um, that doesn't go away. It's, it's hard to leave that trauma behind. But what I do know is that public conversations like this, although they might be difficult, they're also part of the healing process. And that's why I think it's so important for us to continue these public conversations. Um, that's why it was one of the main um, fights that the working group uh, took on when we first formed back in 2018, was to start having public conversations because we know that sexual harassment, all types of harassment and discrimination more often than not happen behind closed doors where most people can't see them. And when that happens, the darkness is not only over the environment creating the toxicity that we're trying to dismantle, um, but that darkness can be held by the people who experience that trauma. And one of the ways to heal, one of the ways to change the culture is to let the light in. And that starts by having these conversations, normalizing these conversations, because sadly, this type of harassment and discrimination, especially sexual harassment, especially up in Albany, um, is normal. There are not many of us who have spoken out. Um, I first spoke out in January of 2018 um, after I was a staffer up in Albany, much like the assembly member was back, you know, before she was elected um, for a state senator who decided to shove his tongue down my throat. Um, and it took me years to, to come forward. Um, and I came forward because I realized that by not telling my story, I was possibly leaving other people behind and perpetuating this idea that what happened behind those closed doors had to stay behind closed doors. And that put other people at risk. And so by having these types of conversations, we know that we're letting other people know that they are not alone and that this is something that we know is not normal, however normalized it might be. And so when the working group started in 2018, and we asked uh, the state legislature and the governor to slow down and include survivors in the process, what we were really asking for was for a vocal public seat at the table. For people with the lived experiences that we have all had, as Karen mentioned, um, we are a workers collective. Everybody um, has experienced uh, harassment, discrimination, or retaliation at the hands of elected and appointed officials, both at the city and state level, uh, while working for the city and state legislature. Um, and we knew that it was our experiences that was going to help change the system. Um, unfortunately, we were not provided that seat at, at the, the first instance. And so we took it upon ourselves to work with elected officials, work with other experts and advocates um, in creating policies that we knew would have helped us in our specific situations. Once we rolled that out in uh, June of 2018, we also knew that our experiences weren't the only ones that mattered. They were siloed. They were in Albany in a specific kind of workplace and that other people, and I know Tifa had to discuss this, um, Catalina brought it up as well, is that in, across all industries, there are workers who are experiencing harassment and discrimination and feel like they have no choice because that's how they put food on the table. That's how they secure health insurance 
for themselves and for their families. That's how they make sure that they can pay the rent on a month to month basis and make sure that there is some type of roof and hopefully a safe roof over their family's head. We shouldn't put our human dignity at risk just so we can live a dignified life. And that's what has been asked of us. And the working group wanted to fight to create space so every worker can talk about their lived experiences, whether they had talked about it in the past or they had yet to talk about it. And so with the help of elected officials like State Senator Alessandra Biaggi and former assembly member Aravella Simotis and so many others, uh, we were able to secure the first joint legislative public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace in New York State, um, the first time in nearly 30 years, the last time it had happened before that, which was February 2019, um, was under Governor Mario Cuomo, when he created a commission that went around the state and did regional hearings. And what is somewhat unsurprising, but also sad and a little bit shocking is that what they found 27 years ago are the same things that came out of these hearings back in 2019, which shows that we know how to identify the problem. The issue with that and the next step is what uh, we call the working group has really focused on is institutional courage. And this comes from a brilliant woman, Dr. Jennifer Freyd, um, out on the West Coast, who um, has really been studying and coined uh, DARVO, Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim Offender. And this is the type of um, attitude and actions that people, alleged harmers, take when they are brought forward um, and, and tried to be held accountable for their actions. And one way we can dismantle a system that protects uh, abusers and harassers and discriminators is by showing institutional courage, is that people around them, um, let's say an elected official, people around them, their colleagues, the people who work for them, the other people, the other elected officials in different branches, stepping up and truly standing next to the survivors. And not just saying the words, believe all women, believe all survivors, but actually acting on it. That is institutional courage. And that is truly what we see is lacking in, in Albany. And this is not a, a legal change that can be made, right? And, and Catalina had alluded to this um, and so did Latifa. We can change all the policies. We can change all the laws that we want to. But if we don't have people in office who are willing to hold themselves and each other accountable to those laws and to those policies, then they are only worth the paper that they are printed on. And we deserve better. Workers in New York State who work for the government, who work in public service, people who work across all industries deserve better. And it starts by having the people who are in a position of power holding themselves and each other accountable. And that is institutional courage. And I will say, and, and I, I think I might cramp Stanley's style a little bit here, but you know, Stanley wrote something brilliant through his Medium page um, that he posted uh, not too long ago about um, what it meant for him to, to see someone, a colleague of his being harassed while up in Albany uh, advocating one time and reflecting on the fact that he could have done better. That is institutional courage. And that is what we need if we are going to change the culture because this is a type of power abuse. And we know that power abuse is rampant up in Albany. But if we don't have people who are willing to own their actions or truly own their inactions and commit to doing better, we are not going to change the culture. And that means that the laws and policies that we are fighting for are not going to carry the weight that they deserve to carry. We are not going to have the protections as workers that, that we deserve. And frankly, that means that countless people are going to leave public service. I think about this every day, the number of powerful women who never had the opportunity to run for office. Thank God we have people like Catalina in office, right? Who had the experiences and it's channeling her lived experiences to make a better New York state for people who are coming after her, for people who are here now. But imagine how many people left. I left for a few years. I didn't feel like I belonged after my experience. We want to make sure we want to change that culture because that is going to change the dynamic, that is going to change our representation, and that is going to what is that's what's really going to make a harassment-free Albany and a harassment-free New York.
So I'll leave it there.